year around November, I began to ask the Lord uh, for a word. You remember when the centurion came to Jesus and, and his child needed to be healed and, and Jesus said, I'll come with you. And he said, no, 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 I just need a word. Just at the word. And so every year around November, I begin to ask the Lord for the word of the next year. And sometimes it's a word. I mean, like it's a, it's a word, you know, like a sentence word, like a, a word from the Lord. And then sometimes it's just like a word, like just one. In 2019, I was driving down Pertsville praying because that's what you do when you drive down Pertsville. Um, <laughs> It's funny, but it's true. And so I'm praying down Perchville, and I was like, God, what is the word for 2020? You guys remember 2020? That was a fun year. Um, so what is the word, Lord? And I heard the Lord say, this is the year of re reflection, reflection. And I was like, oh, that's weird, because I was hearing all these prophets. There was, this is the year of vision fulfilled. This is the year of perfect. It's 2020, perfect. I was like, ah, I don't think so. I don't sense it. And uh, the Lord told me it's the year of reflection. And I was like, okay, cool. Like 2020 reflection. I got it. It's still vision. I didn't know what he meant, but we found out. And it was the year of reflection. I tell you that because I believe I've heard from the Lord again. I don't perceive myself to be a prophet. Um, I'm just telling and proclaiming to you what I believe I've heard the Lord say for us in this house. As he told me it was the year of reflection in 2020, I believe that this is the year of discipleship for this church. Uh, this is the year that we dig and we learn to be as deep as we are wide. That we expect, that went over better in first service, I'm gonna keep preaching. Uh, that, that this is the year that we learn how to grow roots in an even greater capacity than we bear fruit. Because until you grow, I ain't got time to preach that today. Until you grow the roots of the winter, you will never see the fruits of the summer. It is the year where we learn how to dig a little deeper and not just be satisfied with many or how many, but also how deep. It's the year of discipleship. So the first question that I felt like I needed to answer before we go into this year on the last Sunday of the year, the last day of the year, is what is discipleship? Have you ever asked the question, not figuratively, but actually, what is discipleship? What does it even mean? Oh, I want to be a disciple. We've heard it, or we're disciples. Are we? What does it mean to be a biblical disciple? Like, when, when Simon heard, I want you to be my disciple. What did he think? When Mary of Magdala, the one delivered of seven demons, when she heard, I want you to be my disciple, what, what was her thought of a, of a disciple? When we think of a disciple, we, do, we think of somebody that believes in Jesus. We think of somebody that maybe has been baptized or received salvation, but, but what did these Jews who met this man, Jesus, perceived to be as a Talmud in the original Hebrew, or a Mathit in the Greek. What did that mean? John chapter 8, verse 31. I'm reading from the English Standard Version right here. I'm going to switch it up a lot, so just hang in there with me. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed. Let's read it. Uh, we'll, we'll read uh, the now translation, Jesus said to the Cajuns and the rednecks who believed. Because we've heard this our entire lives, right? We know about Messiah. We've heard the, the stories in this book. He said to the Jews who had believed. He said to the Southerners who had believed. If, everybody say if. If, if you abide in my word. If you abide in my word. I'm going to say it right here and then I'll come back to it. I know more people who think they're a disciple than I know people who live like they're a disciple. And it's easy for me to speak to because it describes a couple of decades of my life. I know more people who think they're, who believe themselves to be a disciple 
than who actually live like they are a disciple. Jesus said, if two people who believed, are you with me? If you abide or continue, this is the same word that John uses when he records that Jesus said, if you abide in me and I in you, then you will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. It, it's not enough to say that you gave your life to Jesus. The question is, are you giving your life? Are y'all with me? It's not a past tense. It's present participle progressive for the English people in the room. If you abide in my word, and I think it is safe to add here, then you are truly, everybody say truly, my disciples. You're my disciples. I think it would help us for the context of the morning to describe the difference between a teacher and a student versus a rabbi with a disciple. A teacher of the law of a subject. Let's say the teachers of the law described in the Gospels. They would explain and teach the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And they would have students, most Jewish children up to the age of approximately 12 years old, would learn the Torah. They could quote the Torah better than we can quote John 3, 17. What is John 3, 17? I know, right? They could quote the Torah. If we said a phrase in the Torah, they could tell you the phrase before and after it. This is how familiar with the law that they were. They learned the law. And a student will learn from a teacher and then decide for themselves what they and how they wanted to apply what they've learned. Right? We learn it, and then we go, ah, we'll see. And I'm afraid that that is what people have done with this book. We listen, we come, we look and watch some of the teachers or the preachers or the pastors and, and we hear the word and like a student, we decide which part of it we want to apply. We read through the gospels and we look at the life of Jesus and like a student learning from a teacher, we try to make the decision of which principle we can operate by and which one God is okay with us not. Up. I gotta get back into the book. So there's a difference between a student with a teacher and a, and a disciple with a rabbi. Let me tell you what a rabbi. A rabbi was someone who didn't just teach the law, not the first five books. No, no, no. They knew the entire book. According to the Jews, it would be referred to as the Tanakh. That is, by the way, Genesis through Malachi. The reason that we at this church do not believe the Apocrypha to be the inspired word of God is because the Jews don't believe the Apocrypha to be the inspired word of God. They believe Genesis to Malachi to be the inspired word of God. The Apocrypha can be secondarily canonical and or accepted by people. Are y'all okay today? Let me teach for a second. If you don't understand this part, just whoosh, and ask somebody later. But the reason that we don't believe the extra books to be inspired word of God, it's not that they're not good books. It's not that there's not some stuff in there that we could learn and apply to our lives, but the inspired word of God is Genesis to Malachi because that's what the Jews believe to be the Tanakh, which is the Torah, the books of the prophets, and the poetry and the history and the writings put together. That's what the Jews believe. So when the Jews heard something quoted from the Tanakh, they knew what it was. And the rabbis were the ones, they didn't just teach it to students, they revealed it to followers. Are y'all with me? I'm over teaching, but hang in here. The rabbi didn't just have the authority to teach it. The rabbi had the authority to reveal it, to show it, to train in, there's a difference between training and teaching. You do understand that, right? I've had a lot of teachers. I hadn't had a lot of trainers. I actually don't mind teachers. I don't like many trainers. Come on, somebody. Y'all with me? So the rabbi had authority, starting with Moses and handed down through the Levitical line. The way that you received the authority was like Paul told the apostle Timothy, that you received the authority, you received the gifts by the laying on of hands. That is an Old Testament principle. The Jews don't call it the Old Testament. They call it the Word of God. You with me? Don't offend a Jew by saying the Old Testament. Say the Word of God. Genesis to Malachi. 
The Tanakh is the Torah, the Navim, and the Ketuvim all together. I wasn't going to teach this, but I feel like this is interesting to a couple of people and everybody else is hanging in there. It's the first five books, the prophets, and the history, and the writings all at the same time. If you're with me, say, oh my. When God looked at Jesus, this is the teaching, it's the fun part. When God looked down at Jesus, when he came up out of the water, he didn't quote the Torah, he didn't quote the Navim, he did not quote the Ketuvim, he quoted the Tanakh. He quoted a phrase from each of those books that the Jews would have recognized when he said, this is my son whom I love, in whom I am well pleased. God authorized Jesus from the book with his word and every Jew standing on the bank knew that they just heard the voice of God authorizing the son of God. This man is no regular rabbi. He's authorized. He's worth following. He's not just a teacher. So a disciple not like a student who would learn and then decide what they wanted to apply. No, no, no. A disciple would forsake all. All of the former. All of the comfortable. The disciple would forsake all. Not to learn from. Come on, you got to catch this. If you missed everything else, catch this. Not to learn from the teacher, but to become like the rabbi. Who I overtaught it. Here, recap. Oh, that's what I was waiting on. <laughs> Discipleship, base definition, is living your life to be like Jesus. That's discipleship in its simplest form. It's a burning desire in your heart to be like Jesus. I know a lot of people who have a burning desire for their child to be the next sports superstar. That did not go well on this side. I know a lot of people who have a burning desire to be the biggest and the best and the most successful. I know a lot of people who have a burning desire to make the most money. And I know many who believe themselves to be disciples. But I fear that I don't know a lot of people who when I look at their actual life, not what they say, but how they live, when I look at their life, I see an individual who has a passion to be like Jesus. Not that you have arrived and yet you press on. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9 verse 23 to all of his followers, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself. Yeah, that's where he started. That's the first step to discipleship. Deny yourself. Blessed is he who is not offended. Blessed is she who is not offended. Take up your cross. When? Only Luke, only Luke puts this word as if he heard something that nobody else heard because it stood out to him in a way that it didn't stand out to anybody else. Take up your cross daily and decide which part of my principles you want to operate by. And follow me. And follow me. The last thing that Jesus told his disciples, who, who by, by the way, wanted to be like him. They, they, they didn't just want to... They, forsook their former life. Now, I'm not saying you gotta go sell everything and move to Kenya. That's not what I'm saying. But you might wanna stop. I'm, I'll come back. The last thing that Jesus told his disciples, according to Matthew, we call it the Great Commission. It is the eternal authority 
Remember who it's coming from, Jesus, the only rabbi to ever receive his authority directly from God. I'm teaching today, we're digging. Jesus came and said to the disciples, all authority, everybody say authority. authority. Yep, I'm just making sure you're awake. All authority in heaven, in heaven and on the earth has been given to me. Watch this, verse 19. So go. Hang on, this is what Jesus is saying. You ready? So I authorize you. Go. Go in what, Lord? Make disciples. Well, you know, I'm just, I mean, we did a group last semester. Yep, that's how it felt in first service when I said it. <laughs> well, you know, we went, we went through freedom and, and we went to, and we went to, and we did, the, and, we fi- and we called the office and nobody ever called us back. <laughs> it's my personality. If you don't like it, you'll love my wife. She's way sweeter than me. <laughs> She's the pastor. Ty Ty. Um, go, because they're excited. All authority has been given unto me. Yes, Lord, in heaven and on the earth. I don't know if he was saying it this way. So go, yes, and make the what? He wants us to do what he did. I can't do that. I know. If you could do it, then Jesus could have stayed in heaven. Go and make disciples of all. Whoever God puts in front of you, that's your neighbor. Make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them. I can't believe y'all don't. I mean, the, the, the pastor didn't want to baptize. No, I want your friend to baptize you. If John the Baptist can baptize Jesus, then you can baptize the people that you lead to Jesus. Come on, somebody. We authorize you because he authorized us. I'm not trying to make a ministry out of one man's ability to oversee everything. I'm trying to build a kingdom full of disciples that understand the authority in which they have been given to operate. God help me. So you lead them to Jesus, you baptize them. It's fun. All you gotta do is hold the nose, boom. If they fight you, you wash them. Bring them back up. They do or say something dumb, you dunk them again. Not really. No, 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 but, but you go. In America, I think this is the only place in the world where we call discipleship showing up and paying somebody else to do all the ministry. My God, I'm gonna have to take my jacket off. (laughs) Go and make disciples. You don't take a break from discipleship. You know what happens when people take a break from discipleship? They take a break from Jesus. I've seen it over and over again. Make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not just Jesus only, although if you say Jesus, he'll honor that too. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all. Everybody say all. All, not parts, not the pieces that you like, but all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always. I am with you always. Well, I don't know. I, can, I don't know if I can go to a group ever. I, can't, I don't know if I can commit. I don't, know, I don't know if I need to. I don't know if I can give that. I don't know if I can pray that much. I don't know if I can read that much. When I read the Bible, it doesn't make any sense. Whenever I show up, nobody seems to care that I'm there. And blah, 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 blah. Stop worrying about what people think and produce on behalf of an audience of one. That's discipleship. That you will do it because you know that God is with you and God is for you. You'll spend the rest of your life trying to be like Jesus. Every single day, a student will learn and decide. Here's my heart. This is the vision. If we're going to be a church 
that has 1,200 to 1,500 to 1,800 to 2,200 people a week coming to services on Sunday. We need disciples. And hear me. I'm going to challenge you with this. I'm believing for more disciples in 2024 than we've ever had before. Catch this. I'm not saying you're not born again. I'm not saying you haven't received salvation. I'm not saying you're not going to heaven. That's another conversation. You can't even begin discipleship unless you're a child of God, unless you've received salvation and been born again. That's the first step, but we got way too many satisfied babies. What I'm talking about is in 2023, if you made a disciple, then you began becoming a disciple. If you did not make a disciple, well, I'm a parent. No, 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 no. That's easy. If you did not make a disciple in 2023, then you did not take the first step of becoming a disciple in 2024. And all we're saying is that wherever you are, take the next step. That's what it is. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I want you to sense the conviction of the Holy Spirit to change something in your life so that you look more like Jesus next year than you did last year. Are you with me? Don't walk out of here heavy hearted today. Know that the Lord is with you. But here's what I want to say about discipleship and then I'm going to move because I'm believing God. I'm writing it on my card for 450 to 500 people in groups. I need you to understand, we don't just count how many people come on Sundays. That's important, we care about you. God wrote a book called Numbers. We think they're important too, okay? But we count. What we see as our church is how many people do we have leading groups, in groups, and serving. That's our church. Those people are becoming disciples. If you're not in that group of people, then my conviction for you this year would be to take the next step because I'm believing God for 500 people to be in groups being discipled. That's twice as many as we had last year. I'm believing for God to raise up more leaders that don't need a group. They just need one. My God, I'm gonna preach right here if I'm not careful. One-on-one discipleship. I don't know what I'm doing, but I know who I'm following. Come on, somebody. All I'm doing is inviting you along in the journey as we do our best to become like Jesus. A disciple would forsake all. And we can only call ourselves disciples if we're being discipled and we're making disciples. Now, catch, I gotta, this is the last thing and then we're moving. The discipleship process can only be reciprocated or it can only start again once it's finished a cycle. Are you with me? Just see this circle. The cycle is I become a disciple, I make a disciple. And many people call themselves a disciple because they believe in Jesus. That's not discipleship. Many people call themselves a disciple because they made a disciple. And they call, they call that just bringing your child to church. That's a great step, but that's not discipleship. Discipleship is training. So you're technically, catch this, if you're still with me, you're technically only a disciple when you make a disciple that makes a disciple. That's the circle. When you make a disciple that is making a disciple. Now you can start again with another group or another individual. God wants us to make disciples so that we can minister to the people that he sends. He wants us, come on, can you catch this with me? Vision is the distance between your present and your potential. I'm casting vision between our present and our potential. I believe that God has called this church to parent other churches 
to help them out of the rut, to get them out of the grave with both ends kicked out. I believe that God has called this church to plant churches. Come on, somebody, to raise up ministers. I don't know whether it'll be in Louisiana or Africa or India or Asia or all of the above. I believe that God has called this church. This is in my spirit because there's always more. I serve a God of extravagance and abundance. I serve a God who has eternity at the palm of his hand. I believe that God has called us to support and or open women's and children's centers and develop rehab and addiction centers. I believe that God has called us to pioneer and support ministries that haven't even been dreamt of yet. I believe that God has called this church to continue to pay off this building so nobody's worried about what we already owe as if God can't afford it. My God, help me preach. And I believe that God has called us to plant, to pioneer, to produce, and instead of being faithless and perverse, we become faithful and productive on behalf of the kingdom of God because we are being what God called us to be. We are disciples who want to be like Jesus. And if we're going to pay for this building and we're going to continue to add students to ECA so that we equip and train and raise up ministers and leaders and pastors and teachers and evangelists and prophets, how many of you know America needs a prophetic voice unlike they've ever had before? If we're going to raise up apostles that lead leaders on behalf of the kingdom of God, if we're going to raise up entrepreneurs and people who can get in these colleges and say some truth without worrying about what somebody else is going to think, then we've got to be disciples. There are three spiritual disciplines. I'm going to talk about one of them. In Matthew chapter 6, you can go read it for yourself. God help me. I got five minutes. There are three spiritual disciplines in Matthew chapter 6. Nobody likes talking about the first one, so I'm not going to talk about it on the last day of the year. The first one, Jesus says, when you give. See, nobody likes it. 200 people, not one amen. Amen. A lot of oh my's, but no amens. Come on, somebody. Jesus said, when you give, because you can't be a disciple if you don't give. That's why we teach it. I have never preached giving to you because we had a need. But when you give, your Father in heaven, says the Lord, sees what you do. And then he says, when you pray, because you cannot be a disciple when you are not communicating with rabbi. And then he says, when you fast, and everybody's like, oh, that church, that charismatic people, they always, they fasted and pray. Oh, no, 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 no. It's just one of the three. When you fast, as if everybody just does it. Some of y'all are like, I'm fast. Food. I do that all the time. <laughs> Can't figure out why I ain't got no money. <laughs> when you fast. So here's my question. Why do we fast? Why do we fast? Matthew chapter 17, verse 17. The disciples come up to Jesus and they ask him a question. They said, Lord... Actually, a man comes up to Jesus with a son who's possessed by a devil and says, your disciples couldn't cast out this devil. And Jesus looks over at the disciples. You notice he didn't rebuke the man for bad parenting. That's what we want. That's what we want to do. Well, if he were parenting his kid. Blah, blah, blah. He brought him to you. And the, disciple, the man says, your disciples couldn't cast this devil out. They think it's super spiritual. And Jesus looks at his disciples and says, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer do I have to stay with you? What is he saying? Faithless. That means you are not connected to the Father. Because if you were connected to the Father, you would have faith because the Father is faith. Perverse. What is he saying? He says, you are way too connected to the world. And that is why you can't do this. And Jesus turned around to the little boy. He didn't spit on him. He didn't dump a bucket of oil on him. He didn't shake him, spin him, or throw him on the ground. He just said, come out. The Bible says he rebuked the demon and cast it out. He just rebuked and cast him out. And the disciples asked, look, verse 19, the disciples said, Jesus, 
why couldn't we do that? Why couldn't we do that? Because they knew what Mark wrote that whoever believes and is baptized shall lay hands on the sick and they shall be healed. They shall cast out devils. They shall tread on serpents and drink poison and not be harmed. Like they knew that this was a byproduct of believing and being baptized and yet they could not do the simplicity of casting out a devil. Hey, did you know that what we see as supernatural, God sees as common for his children? It's not impressive to cast out a devil. Because Jesus did that. What's impressive is when you begin to operate in what Jesus said you would operate in, which is even greater works than these that you have seen. The disciples said, why couldn't we do that? And Jesus said in verse 20, because you don't believe. Because of your unbelief. What he's not, he's not saying because of the way that you think alone. What he's saying is because I'm looking at the way that you behave and it doesn't line up with the way you say you believe. See, if, if you want to know what you really believe, then just look at how you live. So, so watch, so watch. I can measure, I can measure my belief on three disciplines. And you're not going to like this, so just buckle up and stay put for a second. I can measure my belief based on how much I give. Now, we did way better in 2023, but I looked for the first time in my life in 2022 as we were preparing to or not to build in Jesus' name. And unless in 2022, that's not 2023, we better this year, but unless we had about 500 people in our church that only make $20,000 a year, mm, then we didn't believe a whole lot in 2022. I'm just saying. I can measure how much I believe based on how much I pray. I don't have time to preach it. I think that we can measure how much we believe based on how much we serve, how much we give, how much we pray, how much time we spend in this book. Many people think, well, I try to believe, but I just have so much doubt. That's because you don't spend enough time in the book. Because my Bible says that faith only comes, my God, help me. Pastor Letitia, come back up here so I'll finish this. My, my, the book says that faith comes by hearing and hearing, somebody help me, hearing the Word of God. So if you want your doubt to subside and your faith to rise, you got to get back in this book every single day of your, if you spend more time making money, my God help me today. If you spend more time in a batting cage, on a baseball field, on a football field, at gymnastics, at dance, in the school, in the classroom, no wonder you got more doubt than you have faith. But when you take the time to to get alone with Jesus, the one who said, I will never leave you. And never, I didn't have this in first service. Something that got on me in second service today. If you will spend more time in prayer than you do complaining about what's happening all around you. If you will spend more time getting in this book than you do everything else that you are wasting your life on. If you will spend more time fasting and praying if you'll just schedule it. Oh, I just can't believe this generation. I ain't never seen people so evil and people so, because we've been so complacent. We think fasting is some super spiritual discipline for charismatic people. I don't know. We get offended by giving. We get mad about money a spirit we gotta break it fasting verse 21 Jesus said however this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting this kind of what this kind of faith this kind of devil no 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 that's just the beginning what Jesus is saying is this kind 
the kind of faith it takes to be a disciple. I've taken too long. It only comes by prayer and fasting. Now I'm gonna talk about prayer and fasting in the Wednesday night recording. We're gonna put it on our YouTube channel. I'm gonna teach for 20 minutes on it. I don't have time to take right now, but if you'll watch that, it'll be available for you. We're gonna start a 21 day fast next Sunday. I'm not talking about drinking water only for 21 days. You can do liquids, you can do healthy. Come on, some of y'all just need to eat clean. Some of y'all just need to drink water and eat good food. Stop drinking the other, yeah, I done stepped in something. I smell it on my foot. If you've never fasted before, fast one, one thing that is food and one thing that is fun and spend that time with Jesus. Here's all I'm gonna say about fasting. I'm gonna teach it online. You can go watch it. What we form is even more important than what we fast. What we form is even more important than what we fast. Here's the third and final question. And I'm gonna run into next service. How can I pray? Every one of you have a note card on your chair. Last year, at the end of the year, we wrote our prayer request on this note card. In a second, hang on, listen, 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 listen. You're not gonna know what to do. Some of y'all don't even know how to write an address on a card. It's funny, but it ain't though. They're kind of scary. I don't want you to write anything on this envelope. Pastor Dylan's gonna come in three minutes and give you what to do on the envelope. On this card, I want you to write a couple of things. Number one, I'm asking you. In 2024, for this house, would you pray for God's provision? Just pray God's provision. Second, Second Corinthians chapter two, verse, no, chapter nine, verse 10. Second Corinthians nine, 10. It says, God gives seed to the farmer and bread to eat. And then he says, in the same way, he will provide. I'm telling you right now, if God doesn't provide, we're not gonna make it. He will provide. By the way, he'll provide through you and me. He will provide. And then I saw this, and he will increase your resource. You can never go wrong praying God's word. Did you hear me? You can never go wrong praying God's word. Pray for God's provision for this house because this is just the beginning of what he's called this church to do. He will provide. Why? So that he can produce a harvest of generosity. A harvest. A harvest of generosity. The second thing I want you to pray for is I want you to pray for unity in this body, in this house. It's Ephesians chapter four, verse three. Make every effort to dwell in the spirit of unity. It's not in your notes. You'll have to look that one up all on your own. Pray for unity. Because I'm telling you right now, if you're writing, keep writing. But I want you to listen as you write. In 2024, this will be the most divisive presidential election that we have ever seen in the face of history. And the devil will try to divide you. You need to listen to your daddy more than you listen to the division of the devil. Because your brother and sister in Christ might not vote like you. That went over like a toot in a funeral. Did you hear me? I'm telling you. Now listen, I will preach the issues from this pulpit. We will not kill babies and call it choice. I will preach the issues from this pulpit. God created them male and female, and he called the man to leave his mama and be joined to his wife. One man with one woman. We'll preach the issues. You pray for unity in the body. Don't you let the devil divide you. Here's the third thing. This is for me, for us. I need you to pray for our staff. I need you to pray for us. School and church, pray for us. This is a calling. Now you're called too at your place. But God has called us to lead in a capacity that we've never led before. And I need you to pray for us. I need you to cover us. I'm asking that you do. There's a final thing that I'm gonna ask for you to pray. As you pray for all those things, I want you to write down Psalm 6511. Psalm 6511. Many people like to pray for the harvest. The Bible doesn't say to pray for the harvest. It may say it in a different way. It's not that it's evil that you would pray for people to be saved. 
But when Jesus talked about the harvest, he did not say, pray for the harvest. What did he say? Come on, somebody help me. Just think about it with me. He said, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers. I need you to pray that God would send laborers. Psalm 65, 11. You crown the year with a bountiful harvest. You crown the year with a bountiful harvest. This is for somebody. Even the hard pathways overflow with abundance. Hey, if you just committed your life to Christ, or maybe you recommitted your life to Jesus, listen, we want to celebrate with you and connect with you. The best way that we do that is through a text. Would you text I believe to 84576? It is as simple as that. Again, that's I believe to 84576. We have a team standing by that would love to connect with you. They want to celebrate with you. In fact, we even want to pray with you. All you have to do is go to our website, eunicechurch.com, or you can download our church app, New Hope Eunice. Either way, we have a prayer request tab that you can fill out right there that goes directly to our team and our staff. And we would love to start this journey with you, connecting with you and celebrating with you. While you're on that, check out all of our events that we have going on here at New Hope. Man, join a small group, sign up for Next Steps, and we can promise you this, that this will be your church home and you can find a place here. Before you go, simply open up your hands like I'm handing you a gift, and please let me pray a special blessing over you right now. God, I pray, Lord, for every person watching, that you would bless your people. God, that you would shine your face upon us and be gracious to us. Lord, lift up your countenance upon us and give us your peace. And help us, Holy Spirit, to anoint us and to accomplish the vision that you have given us here at New Hope. And that is to meet people and grow closer to you together. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you again for watching and stay tuned for anything and everything that we have going on here at New Hope. God bless.